Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, welcome to the 12th lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. Uh, today we are going to sort of, uh, you know, steer in a direction which will provide a more definitive measure of spatial dependence. We will obviously mobilize the concept of spatial stationarity that we, uh, you know, covered in the previous lecture. Uh, if you think about it, we have covered quite a bit of ground uh, uh, till now, right? So if we, if we sort of, you know, before moving forward to a uh, quite substantial, uh, you know, substantially different direction, let's do a short recap in order to appreciate the ground that we have covered till now and how sort of it binds together and, and provides a pathway for the next, uh, uh, you know, chapter in this, in this series of lectures. Um, so, 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 if we were to do a short sort of recap, short and quick recap, the first, uh, you know, we started this course with an introduction to modern data sets, modern spatial data sets, and their applications, right? So, we sort of, you know, uh, sort of looked at who cares about spatial analysis, who uses which sector in the, in the industry uh, has, has an extensive use of, of these, uh, you know, of this tool set and where does it fit in academic research and so on and so forth. We also saw that, you know, now we have uh, quite many freely available, ready to use spatially delineated data sets, right? Um, after that, we developed what we called as a general spatial model. Uh, a general spatial model basically provided us with mathematical devices in order to summarize uh, the data that we see uh, pictorially or visually, right? So we are very used to looking at spatial data as an image, right? As a picture that you can click on a camera of your phone or, you know, very sophisticated cameras, uh, you know, uh, that may be handheld, uh, could be mounted on a drone, or even, you know, attached to, uh, you know, a satellite as a sensor, right? Um, all of these data sets can be sort of, you know, uh, summarized using a general mathematical model, right? And, and when we did that, we looked at things like distance metrics, right? different distance metrics that help us summarize, uh, you know, the spatial patterns uh, in, in these data sets. And we also looked at what we called as the data structures, right? So the data sets come in various, uh, you know, uh, uh, structures and we also have, uh, you know, we, we also summarize them, some of them as vector data, raster data, within those there are several other forms. Uh, you know, we have these definitions called geostatistical data, lattice data, right? So, uh, and so on. So, uh, vector and raster are formats to store data, whereas, uh, you know, geostatistical or lattice data or point data, polygon data, so on and so forth are, you know, uh, are ways to manipulate or analyze uh, those data. So, the structures have, have different forms and meanings and uses, right? After that, we changed the, our gears a little bit. We looked at this concept of spatial entropy, Right, we, look, we took entropy as a measure of variation in space, right? General variation in space. And then we use this pattern to provide a model for a monocentric city, all right? And, and after we covered a spatial entropy, that is a measure of variation over space, we move one step further and we started something like spatial autocorrelation. 
okay so from a general measure of variation in space we went on to talking about a measure of dependence in space right and 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 we looked at spatial autocorrelation and its consequence for consequence consequences for statistical inference we did this in one dimensional with one dimensional you know sequence of data we also did this for two dimensional sequence of data then we went on to you know also uh, uh, study uh, you know uh, 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 i'm just going to say four continued we also looked at what we say call as monte carlo simulations right which we said that look i mean you have all these mathematical analytical results uh, which can be quite complex at times they involve uh, you know applying uh, uh, algebra calculus and various other uh, concepts um, a numerical substitute or an alternative for these analytical results that we have uh, that we study uh, in in statistics are our simulations right and and specifically monte carlo simulations after that we covered what is called as the exploratory spatial data analysis right we said that whenever we get a data set our first job is to summarize that data set what if we get a data set which is spatially delineated so we covered methods and tools that are specifically designed for such data sets and just in the previous you know a uh, couple of lectures we have looked at the concept of spatial stationarity okay spatial stationarity is crucial it's a decision it is not a hypothesis it is a crucial decision it validates any statistic in space right even mean median outliers whatever we do we must work in a stationary domain to be conduct any kind of spatial analysis okay so now that we have come to a point that we can indeed understand a domain that is stationary and we can conduct a spatial analysis we will now go on to you know uh, 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 formally introduce the idea of spatial contiguity or spatial continuity and provide a measure for this or, or alternative measures for spatial contiguity over stationary domains so going forward whenever we define these concepts including the means and 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 variances and and you know measures of summary statistic for spatial contiguity or spatial autocorrelation we are going to be assuming that we are working with a stationary domain and wherever we have you know a discussion is due in order to sort of make sure that we are indeed working with a stationary domain we will you know uh, 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 provide that discussion okay so let's move uh, right uh, let's let's sort of uh, you know move forward so spatial contiguity is you know could also be called as spatial continuity ultimately we are thinking about spatial dependence okay we are right we are thinking formally about spatial dependence so let's figure let's start with the you know figure in front and let's talk about the panel on the right so let's look at the right panel first so the right panel provides me data which are visually delineated with five different colors okay these colors are uh, you know uh, green gray orange uh, uh, black and blue say these colors represent different levels of intensities at which the data are recorded often these intensities are also called as digital numbers right so we assign a number a unique number to each color so that you know each color sort of is providing a categorical level at which the data are you know observed quite clearly on the right hand side what is happening is that you have data distributed in columns where the data moves first at level 1 then level 
and level 3 and then level 4 it's going to be and then level 5 all right now what the uh, the the utility of having data distributed over space on the right hand side the way it is is that there is some kind of a spatial structure going on. And the same spatial structure is that when we begin from left to right, we begin from left and go on to the right direction, what happens is that the, rem the data remain at the same intensity for a certain distance before it crosses onto a boundary, after which it sort of changes its intensity to something else. Okay. That means that there is spatial dependence going on in a left to right such that it sort of changes drastically discreetly after a boundary. Whereas from you know top to bottom, if I start at any given value and I straight go south, I'm going to be on the exact same value. This tells me that if I have an observation at any point on level one, if and and I want to predict an, an unknown value, you know, south of the observed value, right, of it at south, you know, I can actually accurately predict it to be belonging to category one or level one, right? So spatial dependence as categorized in the figure on the right hand side, the right panel, right, pro is 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 providing me an, uh, an opportunity to utilize the fact that this, the data are spatially dependent in a given structure to then predict unknown values from observed or sampled values, right? We talked about the fact that we can't actually realistically sample every location in space, right? It is very expensive, right? and often not even possible because you know all areas in space on the land for example are not accessible right so prediction is key right and if you have some spatial structure some spatial dependent structure right uh, which provides you know a, a a a a kind of a correlation structure over space right a definitive correlation structure then we are looking at a, uh, a scenario where we can use this information in order to predict values of a random variable at unknown locations, right? So if coal were to exist as is the right panel, right? It makes my life very, very easy, right? I can make samples, you know, in a direction, right? Uh, from left to right, and I can find these boundary points and once I find these boundary points, I'm kind of done, right? Once I have my boundary points figured out over space, I don't really need to sample anything else in these columns, all right, right? Because these columns are perfectly correlated from north to south. So all, all I need is an estimate of where the boundary points are. Right? If life were so convenient in the real world, you know, prediction would become very, very accurate and very, very easy. Right? But that's not going to be the case. That's not to be the case so easy. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't appear to be so easy in the real world. If you look at the left panel, that's a case where the data seem to be distributed or the categories or levels seem to be distributed more randomly in space, right? That is to say that if I were to take samples at some locations in space and use those to then, you know, uh, uh, try and predict unknown values, it's going to be not so easy, right? So some of the values are missing, some of the values are known, right? So the, the circles are missing data. And my objective as analyst is to be predicted, to predict these data. And crosses are where I have my sample observations. 
So I can merely use uh, the data that are observed at these, you know, uh, 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 the, these locations where I'm sampling them and I want to predict, you know, what's happening at unknown locations, right? It is quite possible that some of the locations might not have any known samples. And then if there are so many boundaries to be predicted in so many different directions, it's going to make my life very, very hard to figure out, you know, what's the structure, spatial dependence structure, do we have any? Of course, there is, there is, there is a lot of very strong spatial, you know, dependence within each block or each polygon, so to say. But in order to predict where the boundaries of these blocks will sort of, you know, uh, end or we are going into a different regime, I'm going to have to do more intense, more costly sampling. And I really don't know, you know, if, if this structure on the left panel is, ex, is, exists beneath the ground, I really don't know how many samples to take where. It's a very difficult abstract problem. So the panel on the left represents a scenario where there is no or little spatial contiguity or spatial continuity, right? That is, there is little or no, you know, very less correlation in data on the left hand side, you know, across samples in space. And, you know, uh, you're going to, you're looking at somehow random values being observed, you know, at different locations in space, right? If I were to go in and, you know, sample locations sparsely, I will probably merely get data, you know, in all different, you know, uh, regimes. They're going to be very different values. I'm going to be confused when I look at them. I'm not going to be able to find a structure and, you know, Honestly, it's going to be very, very hard to predict what the unknown values are with a sparse sampling exercise. Okay, right? Everything that is non-sampled is actually unknown, right? So the circles are everywhere. We do not have the crosses. So you can imagine the kind of intense exercise it would be to predict, to conduct spatial prediction when the, you know, real world natural structure is given as a left hand panel versus the right hand panel, right? And, and, and we really, it's hard to learn from sample observation. So spatial dependence, spatial contiguity, although when we look at it, you know, as a, as a concept to learn separately as, a, as, as, a, as something to estimate, it seems like, you know, it is more work. But on the other hand, it provides us a utility on the, on, on the side of prediction. That is, if I know a few values, if I know a few values at the boundary, you know, I can know everything else without doing much, right? So some pain in, in, in estimating, uh, you know, spatial dependence structures, but a lot of value in terms of spatial prediction, okay? Uh, let's sort of, you know, provide a, a definition to spatial contiguity. It is a summary of spatial pattern as a univariate statistic, just like mean variance, but beyond mean and variance. It is typically a measure of correlation of values over space, values being observations, right? And I say values, I basically means mean uh, data values, right? So, so observations in space, and it's a measure of how similar or homogeneous these values are over space. Um, Spatial contiguity provides information that may be useful for prediction in space, right? So, so it is a, it is the sort of the, the utility, the utility of going through this process of estimating spatial dependence of, you know, learning about spatial dependence in data. Okay, all right, let's move forward. Let's look at this uh, much more sort of a, a nicer example by Professor Michael Perch. Now on the left hand side, you re see a really random process, right? I mean, you have these little, little, little cells over which the data is, 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 is distributed. And if you're standing on any cell, it's really, really hard to predict, you know, what's going on in its neighborhood because the neighborhood is so heterogeneous. It is so different no matter where you stand on this left 
panel, right? So you have, uh, you know, a, sp a very high spatial heterogeneity going on, uh, even local spatial heterogeneity going on on the left panel. On the right panel, however, we see a very non-random spatial process, right? On the right panel, what happens is if I stand at any location, I have some level of confidence that, you know, around me, things are going to look very, very similar, okay? Of course, there are complications because there are these boundaries over which the processes change, but you can imagine that, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, a not so intense sampling exercise can provide us where the boundaries are and once we know the boundaries we we will know you know uh, uh, what to expect of the values in the neighborhood right so again an example where the left panel provides us no spatial dependence so you know if you know spatial statistics probably you don't really uh, you know get too further uh, in in the sense of estimating the structure of spatial dependence but then you also don't have any information for prediction. On the right hand side, you can, you have a, a situation which is much closer to spatial processes, right? If you think about long term geological processes, the way, you know, land structures, elevations, dams, uh, not dams, sorry, river structures, uh, you know, river pathways come about, you know, those are, you know, uh, you know, glacially, glacial processes, right? So they have been happening over time, they are very slow, and they are also highly spatially contiguous. You don't have plains and mountains moving, you know, mountainous regions, you know, uh, 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 you know, fluctuating over space. You have a mountainous belt, and then you have a large plain structure, just like if you think about the geography of, of India, right? So learning about spatial statistics indeed sort of provides us to, you know, an opportunity to model such structures, but then also to conduct prediction, which has a lot of economic and social value, okay? Um, now here, you know, it's an example where we can consider a decision to harvest groundwater from an aquifer having different permeability measures, right? So an aquifer is something that we saw last time. It's a rock structure beneath the ground and it could be permeable or porous or non-permeable or non-porous, right? The colors on the right hand side, you can think of them as providing a gradient from permeability to non-permeability, right? So reds could be highly non-porous rocks, just like, you know, tubs where water doesn't move around laterally. And, and blues, I mean, moving from red to yellows to greens to blues, we are moving towards more porous structures. Now, if you want to understand where should we draw uh, groundwater from or where the depletion could be a lot bigger problem, well, such an understanding of the structure beneath the surface will be very, very useful. And in, in the sense that, you know, if I draw water from, say, let's say, location where I have sort of marked on your screen, you know, there will be a larger spillover on these, you know, porous structures except for this little red rock in the middle, you know, if I were to draw a lot of water from this, you know, southwest well. If I draw water from this central well, it's going to cause a lot of spillover in its, you know, uh, uh, northwest and western direction uh, uh, and, and very little in this non-porous direction, which is the southeast direction, right? So the spillovers in groundwater levels, that is, Decle depletion or decline will probably happen more and more in the locality in not in directions that are not the northeastern direction where you have these high non-porous rocks, right? So there's no, they're not going to allow water to flow in if you start drawing a lot of water from the central well, okay? So such economic decisions are possible if we have spatial dependence in space or spatial contiguity in space. Um, what I present here is another very nice, I think a very nice, uh, you know, uh, uh, a way to sort of understand if you, if you see data, if you, if you have a univariate data set where you have porosity measures and depth from ground uh, or, you know, uh, from any location depth going uh, in any direction over space, then if you plot these data and they look highly, highly irregular, right, they look highly irregular, then that's a signal of low spatial 
correlation in the data. Low spatial correlation means less spatial contiguity. That's more like left panels, the two figures that we have seen. And that means lesser information for prediction, which is also clear the fact that, you know, if you were to sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, observe, let's say these three observations uh, that I've marked with a cross going down, it's going to be very hard to predict what's coming next, right? Versus if you were doing it, for example, in case of a very high spatial correlation structure, which is the figure in the, uh, you know, in the third, uh, in the second quadrant, right, which is then uh, on the on the on the southeast of this uh, of this image, then you know predicting you know will be easier if you had you know unknown samples uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know relative to the figure on the northwest uh, you know of this of this image. Okay. All right. So next step. Now that we understand spatial contiguity. Its, its utilities and so on and so forth. The next step is measuring spatial contiguity. And the good news is we have already seen the devices, uh, you know, most of the devices that are involved in measuring uh, spatial contiguity. First is the variogram. Now, when we studied intrinsic stationarity, we, we actually specified a variogram in the definition of intrinsic stationarity. So, the variogram is written as 2 gamma S1 minus S2, S1 and S2 are vectors and S1 minus S2 means the distance between these vectors, so distance metric and location. And they're equal to variance of the first difference between values observed at this, uh, at this distance, right? Uh, we also looked at the covariogram last time, which is nothing but covariance of the values observed at any two locations in space. We also have a correlogram, which is nothing but a correlation analog with, you know, univariate statistic when you move from covariance to correlation, we move, we, we can imagine moving from co co a covariogram to a correlogram, right? So we will see, we will, we will go over these devices or these measures one by one, but I have some notes for you on the right hand side of the screen, which I would like to go over uh, before we go there. So, so all these measures are defined over a you know, domain of analysis, right? So as analysts, we choose this domain. We have talked about this quite a bit in this lecture, in this lecture series, right? So this D, it must be a stationary domain, right? For any and all of these statistics to be valid. If we are working with a non-stationary domain D, then we cannot define a variogram, right? So the variogram remains undefined. C0 is the variance of random variables at a given location. So C0 is just covariance of ZS1 and ZS2, where S1 is exactly equal to S2. If S1 and S2 were exactly equal, their distance between them will come become zero, and this covariance will just be the variance, right? This is something we are already aware of. The quantity gamma is called as the semi-variogram. Variogram is a measure of dissimilarity over distance. Well, we will look at it more carefully in a couple of uh, in a couple of minutes. And uh, the covariogram is, not a, is a measure of similarity over distance. So what I am declaring right away is that variogram and covariogram are directly inversely related. Okay, this is also something that we have seen earlier, but now going forward, we will now develop these things more formally and look at their statistical properties. Okay. Um, now, one thing that, that we see here is, uh, you know, a lag vector H. Now, H is a vector as seen during discussions of stationarity again, is the L2 norm or the distance metric between two locations, uh, location vectors S1 and S2, right? H always and always will contain two pieces of information. One is the direction, right? Where is the sec when when we look at a pair of observations, what direction are we moving when you're moving from S1 to S2 or S2 to S1, vice versa, right? And the other is obviously the distance, right? And we here what I've done is I've simply sort of taken the definitions of variogram, covariogram, and correlogram, and you know I have uh, you know uh, 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 given you uh, the definitions in terms of H rather than. S1 minus S2 in the vector form, 
Okay. So going forward, we are going to now sort of we are we are we will discuss the variogram in in detail.